I'm Phil Rader, and this is a presentation on and a reflection of my photographic practice for PHO 720 Informing Contacts. John Kruk was a popular American baseball player in the 1980s and 90s, an all-star for three seasons in a row, and a quotable and colorful character. When a woman commented on what an outstanding athlete he was, Kruk replied, I ain't an athlete, lady. I'm a ball player. Part of his comment ended up as the title for his memoir, a self-deprecating acknowledgement of his skills. When I began my own photographic practice, Crux's response to that woman was in the back of my mind. I ain't an artist. I'm a photographer. Why? Because much of my practice was journalistic and somewhat documentary in nature. While I worked hard to create well-crafted images, the thought of it being art seemed pretentious. Some examples along those lines include my focus on education, as I work for a major educational system, and documentary events involving students, teachers, and schools. During the pandemic, while so many people, including photographers, were isolated and turning inward, I was fortunate to be able to document COVID-19's impact on education, from the emptiness of classrooms during virtual learning to the very first vaccinations given to teachers. Capturing sports at various levels of competition throughout the year is another key part of my practice. Because I live in the state of Iowa, its unique role in national politics has brought me close to some of America's political leaders along with the ambient scenes around their presidential campaigns. And living in the midst of one of the most volatile periods in U.S. history, documenting the right to protest, while it lasts, has been another important focus of my work. When reflecting on my own photographic practice, I tend to share the attitude of Saul Leiter, not overthink or overanalyze. I don't have a philosophy, I have a camera. Or better yet, Elliot Erwitt. If you're taking pictures, why use words? But such brevity is probably not for the best in an academic setting, or in reflecting on why I do what I try to do with a camera. Instead, the words of Henri Cartier-Bresson, not the oversighted, decisive moment, but rather photography's ability to freeze time perhaps better describes what drew me to photography in the first place, capturing things that will never again happen. As I began to study photography more seriously, first independently, then completing my Bachelor's of Fine Arts degree at Arizona State University and now in the Master's program at Falmouth, I gave more thought to how I was being influenced by other photographers and how I wanted to be influenced, for example, by photojournalists like James Notway or Ron Haviv. While I'm no conflict photographer, nor possess the bravery their work requires, I am influenced, I hope, by their ability to be responsive and adaptive to documenting what spontaneously presents itself before their lens. I also find myself drawn to the new topographics and their redefinition of landscape photography nearly 50 years ago, such as Stephen Shore or Robert Adams, an approach to landscape photography that was documenting real life beyond just pretty pictures of nature. Alex Soth, a fellow Midwest American, is a photographer I've long admired, in particular, his approach to portraiture. And more recently, Dina Lawson. Both Soth and Lawson have a more natural environmental approach to portraying people that feels authentic and genuine, not simply posed and staged. And in recent years, I've become especially interested in conceptual documentary work, such as Debbie Cornwell's reportage of the U.S. military base and prison at Guantanamo, along with the work of Anne Mele. Their photography has influenced me in working to take a more subtle, less direct approach in creating visual narratives. While my photographic journey began with the comments of a baseball player, as I grew both as a practitioner and student of photography, the words of Robert Adams better reflect my thinking. Of course, photographs can serve more than one purpose at the same time. And so I find myself trying new approaches and, with some good fortune and dumb luck, had some work exhibited and published. This is this image of a goat standing atop a long abandoned truck left in a farm field. Or this double still life honored at the Rhode Island Center for Photographic Arts. Or this worm's eye view of a war memorial, which actually won a blue ribbon at the Iowa State Fair. But I continued to return to more straightforward photojournalistic and documentary photography, finding more enjoyment and success. Two examples are these. The image on the left from a meeting about immigrant rights a month after Trump took office was shown at the Aperture Foundation Gallery in New York City, while the image on the right of a baseball player on the first day of practice during the pandemic 
was included in a book published by the International Center of Photography. Which for me raises a larger question. Did documentary photography mark the beginning of modern art? As Stuart Franklin, a photographer at the Magnum Agency and author of the documentary Impulse wrote, with the invention of the camera and the work of its early practitioners, Photographs replaced painting in depicting realism, and the years and decades that followed all but forced painting and other visual arts to reinvent themselves by way of Impressionism, Cubism, Abstractionism, and more. As Susie Linfield notes, photography was the great democratic medium. With that kind of influence, the camera shifted the balance of power among the visual arts, with photography having the power to perhaps reach where none of the others could go. My interest and influences have led me to a project I call At the Bottom of the Driftless, an examination of one part of a unique region in the American Midwest that I feel will be reflective of a more conceptual documentary approach in my work. For those of you unfamiliar with U.S. geography, this is the Driftless, and this is my focus. Alex Oath often talks about how photographs might not be good at telling stories, but are great at suggesting stories. My aim is to create a visual narrative around the many layers of this region. One of the many layers of the Driftless is nature. The region was untouched during the last ice age and so is covered with forest and limestone bluffs and creeks not found in much of the central United States. Being largely farmland and small towns, the socioeconomics of the Driftless is another important layer to explore. Politics cannot be ignored especially now and especially here. This region is home to voters who were longtime Democrats, but are now wildly pro-Trump. From wineries to breweries to artists and music venues, the culture of the Driftless is a part of the narrative which contains elements unexpected in rural America. And finally, this is personal. My wife and I were both born and raised in the region, and today are in the process of restoring a farmhouse which has been in her family since 1870. As I continue to work on this project, there are two crossroads about its style and scope that lie ahead. One is black and white versus color. On the one hand, color is more natural and authentic and, in my opinion, more vibrant. After all, it's how we see. On the other hand, black and white is classic, well suited for the Leica I'm using, and provides for more consistent tones across the body of the work. The other consideration is how broad or narrow this project is in the end. Ultimately, family and my personal history is its foundation. My focus on family isn't necessarily like Larry Sultan's pictures from home or Gillian Lobb's family matters. It is more akin to Christopher Taylor's Steinholt, his look at his Weiss family farm in Iceland versus my look at my Weiss family farm in Iowa. In the weeks and months ahead, I will be making photos at several more locations and events in the region documenting both people and scenes from the Driftless. By this time next year, as we head into the final project for this program, I plan to be at a point to focus on sequencing and then developing a photo book proposal. After reflecting on my work, it will hopefully be a reflection of my work.